So I'd like to take some time to work through the sample examination paper for probability. Um, so again, this is the sample paper from 2013 for probability, which is uh, standard 3.13. And uh, let's take a look at question one, get straight into it. So at the time of the 2006 census, 65% of people aged 15 or over were employed. Of the people employed at the time, so this is in people who are employed, there's 77% were full-time and the rest were in part-time work. Alright, so that's a lot of information. Let's um, take a look at what else they're telling us here. So of the people employed full-time, we've got these different statistics and the people part-time, we've got this. So sometimes drawing a diagram or a table like a Venn diagram or a tree is helpful for us to solve these problems. And if I'm looking at this one, I've got a bunch of information. First off, I've got a whole group of people out of a census, and 75% of them are employed. And then of those people who are employed, I've got people who are full-time or part-time, and of the people who are full-time or part-time, there's more stuff to go with it. So there's kind of a sequence of three different events that are going to occur. And that's probably more complex than I can do in a table or a Venn diagram, so I might think about trying to do a probability tree to represent this. So. Um, let's see if we can just sneak it in down here. I have to scroll back and forth, but that's okay. So, starting at the start, um, we've got a census, and there's 65% of the people aged 15 or older are employed. So that means to me, I've got employed. I just put that as an E for employed, and it's 0 0.65 of them. So that means to me, I have 0 0.35 of the population that is not employed. Okay, so that's our first breakup. 65% of the people are actually employed. Now from the ones that are employed, 77% of them are full-time. So that's 0 0.77. And they say the rest work part-time. So coming down here, part-time. And again, within these little splits off the probability tree, we have to add up to 1. So 0 0.77 there, we should get 0 0.23 here for part-time. And now we break it out between our full-time employees have 18% with qualifications. So, sorry, no qualification. So I'll say in Q for no qualification, that's 0 0.18. For high school, I'll just say for school, it doesn't actually say high school, for school, it's 0 0.33. And for post qualifications, we'll say 0 0.49, like they've said there. And then again for part time, we've got no qualifications are at 20%. School, 0 0.43. And then post-qualification, we have 0 0.37. So, sorry, mine's a bit messy. Um, from this probability tree, I can now start to piece together the information they've got, but again, breaking it back, We've got a group of people out of a census, so this is the whole census. 65% of them were employed, so I assume the rest are not employed. And of those groups that were employed, 77% were full-time, so I assume that 23% are part-time. And then I use the stats that they list out for us for full-time or part-time employees. So now let's look at what they're asking in the first question. Calculate the proportion of people. Now proportion is just another fancy word for probability. So we are going to take a look at people from the census who are employed part-time. So they're employed, they're part-time, and they have no qualifications. So which group is that? That is going to be they're employed, they're only employed part-time, and they have no qualifications. And remember when you're using probability trees for calculating things, we're using, we're going to times along each of these branches as we go along. So, that's going to be 0 0.65 times 0 0.23 times 
times 0 0.20 and that will equal roughly 0 0.030 with your rounding and um, just if we want to write it out again that's going to be the probability that they're employed and they're part-time and they've got no qualifications if we use kind of our lingo for that our probability lingo so the key to actually unlocking this problem is being able to figure out how to diagram it for yourself and again if there's kind of like consequential like more than one thing and they all kind of flow on from each other um, events and you're breaking things up into multiple categories sometimes doing it as a tree is helpful Okay. Uh, taking a look at the next problem if two people were randomly selected, so an important aspect here, if two people were randomly selected from the census, calculate the probability that both were employed full-time and justify any assumptions that you've made in your calculation of this probability. Okay, so if I use my probability tree just to think about what's going on here, I want to take let's take one person at the start. If I take with probability for one person they'd be employed would be 0 0.65 and that their full time would be 0 0.77 and we would times those two together again timesing along as we go. So the probability for one person being employed and being full time is going to be 0 0.65 times 0 0.77 so that's just one person. So we might say this as person 1 and if we wanted to think about what the probability would be for person 2 well we might assume that it's the same situation here same thing the probability that they're employed and full-time should also be 0 0.65 times 0 0.77 but why hasn't that changed? Like if I have the whole entire population and I've removed one person from it, technically I've got less people in there. Like if this is without replacement, if I pull that person out and don't replace them, um, it could potentially change the statistics a little bit because there's one less person in that group that I'm pulling out of. But if you think about the population of New Zealand, yeah, we're not a very big country, but still that's a lot of people. If you take one person out, it's not going to make that big of a difference. So that's one of the assumptions that we have about why the probability for person 1 and for person 2 is going to be just 0 0.65 times 77, or 0 0.77. So that ends up being 0 0.505, oops, 0 0.5005. And 0 0.0, I can't say it, 0. 5005. So it's the same probability for both of the people. And if I want to know what the probability is that both of these guys have this happen to them, or girls, whatever they are, both of these individuals are employed full time, I'm basically looking at it as the probability that person one has that criteria and person two has that criteria. So that's another and problem. I could be timesing these together. Another way to write it would be to say 0 0.5005 squared because you know there's going to be two people in there. But you can write it out like this if you like, if it makes more sense. 0 0.251. So here we've got to remember that sometimes using the words and like describing it helps me figure out how to do it if it's an adding or timesing. And here I want the probability of full time and employed, so I need to times there but I'm also looking for the probability that person 1 and person 2 have these things happen to them so I have to times the probability for person 1 and the probability for person 2 and I get this result. Um, now the tricky part here is justifying any assumptions we've made about our calculations. So you might not have noticed it but we've kind of used this idea of independence. Remember your independence formula probability of A and B is equal to probability of A times probability of B. Now this is only true when you have independent events and so what we've tried to assume here is that the probability of person 1 and person 2 is equal to the probability of person 1 times the probability of person 2 Oops. 
being both full time and employed, um, we can only state this as true. So only true if independent. And in this case, why can we assume that the probability for person 1 and for person 2 are independent? Well, we might say because the census is a large population, the probability of person 1 being selected will not drastically influence the probability of person 2 also being um, employed full-time. So this is a situation because of the large sample size and the large population that we're pulling out of in this case, it's not going to have a difference. And an example where that wouldn't be true, just in case you're wanting, wondering when this wouldn't be true, is say for instance if you had like your bag of lollies and you had you know, a few X's and a few O's and there's only seven of them in there. Well, if I take one of these out and eat it, so for instance on the first round the probability of getting an X would be four out of seven, but the probability of getting X after I've eaten one would now be three out of six. It's a much different probability because it's such a small group. But in a large group, like in the population, pulling one out doesn't make a big difference on the probability for anybody else that's still left in there. So that's the difference between when it would be independent, which is the case for the population, the census, and when it wouldn't be if you just have a small little group like lollies out of a bag.